Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. How are you? Very well. Very well. Thanks for coming on. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me <clears throat> on. Yeah, this is this is, guy's in LA. You know, he's 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 of course he is. He's he's playing with David <laughs> at the moment. Wow. Yeah, we just things about the show. Did you play at the um, Albert Hall? Yeah. Yeah, heard good things about that. We did. Oh, that's good. No, no, you were missed. You were missed. But um, yeah. And so, so he's, he's in the he's in the middle of the whole sort of cultural war at the moment. You know, yeah, it's about, it's quite weird. mad. I what? just got my my first driverless taxi yesterday as well. It's all very weird out here. What a driverless taxi? <laughs> yeah. How did that feel? Uh, well, they're terrible drivers over here, so it kind of felt safer. <laughs> <laughs> was, that, was that a Tesla? No, that's the funny. It's not. It's a Jag. It's a Jaguar. <clears throat> Who is the driverless taxi going to vote for? Driver, let's get yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Drive, yeah, driverless taxis at least stay out of the culture wars. So are they, um, anyway, yes. Sorry, is that legal here yet? Yeah. Or is that something no, that's going to come so. over? Wow. It will come over, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Great, I'll get you one. So oh, congratulations, Rachel. Yes. I mean, it's an amazing piece of work, really. It's... Oh, did you manage to listen to the whole thing? I did. I did, did manage to, yeah, yeah. It's I... quite a listen. <laughs> it's just the spectacular arrangements and songs, you know, and you just you just see how much work is involved. Um, when did you start it? I think it actually probably started in 2017, so quite a long time ago. Um, I'd actually wanted to do a big orchestral piece. Um, and the original idea that I had was to use the poetry of Hafiz, who's a Persian poet. Um, but that went a little bit sideways. So I was having lunch with Pete and he said, have you ever read Siddhartha by Herman Hess? And um, I'm not a big reader, so I hadn't. But I read it and immediately I thought this is going to make a great musical. Um, so I just started to write and I wrote the music and lyrics. I probably wrote it in about a year on and off. And we tend to go on holiday quite a lot. Um, and then we recorded it um, and we had a plan to release it with BMG actually in 2020. And then COVID came along and ruined that. So it actually feels like it's been years and years and years um, in the making. Um, but in reality, I probably wrote it and recorded it in about a year. But all musicals forever, don't they? I mean, they're better. Musicals bad. aren't, they're not written, they're rewritten, right? As they, That's how the saying goes. But it's, but yeah, because because well, the fact, like when, when was Christopher Plummer involved? Because that's. So after I'd written that, I've recorded it with the Royal Philharmonic, who um, I've worked with before. We've both, both worked with them quite a lot. Um, and then set about casting it. And Pete, um, I knew Pete was the ferryman, so I had like one person and then who was going to do the rest. Um, and bit by bit, everyone fell into place, um, including sort of calling Elton up and asking if he'd play the rich fat merchant, which um, he was up for, thank God. Um, and, then, and then I wanted I everybody um, to narrate it. I mean, it's funny that you say about theatre taking so long because originally it was, I wanted to get it up as a theatre show. Um, but we did a couple of workshops and we did a workshop with um, the New York Public Theatre uh, with a friend of ours, Oscar Eustace, who's the director there. And he said, yeah, that was a that was a good workshop. Like, uh, we'll do another one in like nine months. And I said to Pete, nine fucking months. Like, I want to get it going. It's not like mm -hmm. writing an album um, where you write your album, you go in, you gather all your bods, you know, in the band, you record it and you get it out. It, you know, it takes years and years and years. Um, and I got really downhearted about it. And it was Pete in the end that said, why don't you do what I did with Tommy and uh, what Andrew did with Jesus Christ Superstar and put out the album? Um, so I had to find, so that's when I wrote the, the narrative to connect all the songs up. Um, and I thought about Morgan Freeman. I always go really big and everybody sort of rolls their eyes. They're like, oh, the top. like <laughs> who the fuck do you think you are? I'm thinking maybe Morgan Freeman. Pete's like, Rachel. Um, <laughs> anyway, but then um, I thought about Chris Plummer and um, actually a mutual friend of ours, uh, director Des McEnough, who's a really good friend of Pete's. Um, oh, did Tommy. Yeah. yeah. So I 
sent it to him and he said, yes, I love it. I want to do it. So I went out to Connecticut and recorded him. He lives in Connecticut um, and recorded him out there. And I think it was the last thing he did, actually, before he he passed away. He passed away the following year. Um, so it has a sort of a particular. Oh, sorry. I'm turning off. For sake. Yeah. Um, you know, it has real sort of meaning for me. It makes me. What's the word? I don't know when I hear his voice. Gravitas. He has gravitas. Yeah, gravitas. Yeah. But also for those of us of a certain age, it's an incredibly reassuring voice from your childhood. I never really knew uh, about much about uh, Nakani. I mean, this is amazing, an amazing vocalist, right? I first came across Nakane right at the beginning before I'd even cast anybody um, through, because they were signed to BMG at the time. And Alistair Norbury from BMG gave me a copy of... Oh, yeah. Uh, Nakane's album and I listened to it and he, you know they've got the most extraordinary voice I mean it's it's not like Seal's but do you remember when Seal came out and had yeah yeah for sure so unique it was really so unlike anything else um, and that's how I feel about um, Nakane and we've become really good friends um, in the pandemic they came and you know stayed in the cottage here for a couple of weeks and did some writing and treated you a bit like a roadie <laughs> a, P, a, a keyboard or a do you have any idea who you were pete i have no idea i mean no <laughs> but, um yeah no so nakane is extraordinary and i'm really excited um to do the concert we've been rehearsing because that's because i'm sorry just saying yeah because what what are you you know you must have a real checklist of things you're looking for for that character I mean, is it someone who's actualized or someone who looks like they're really seeking so or you know? And I would have thought someone like Nakani is is great for that. It was more to do, I think, with the tone of voice, but perhaps right. you say like a personality. Um and I hadn't really even thought about making a list. I think there was a mention of John Legend or um even John Mayer. Um and then I didn't really get very far with any of that before being introduced to Nakane and just felt that, you but know, I think that androgynous... have the name, um, the talent and the, and the voice. Was the extreme. androgynous quality that he has, they mm. have, is, mm. is really, I think works really well in this. Mm. Um, and of course, how, how did you present the songs to them? Did you do the demos, Rachel, singing? So I work with a producer and an arranger uh, called Martin Batchelor, who's really extraordinarily brilliant. So I would write the songs and work up, you know, some sort of simple arrangement stuff, send it over to Martin. Martin would do his beautiful sort of string arranging and his great rhythmic stuff. And now the sound libraries that you get for orchestral stuff are extremely yeah, um, But no, I definitely did not sing them myself. <laughs> hey, did you just just take, uh, just uh, uh, tell us what it was like reading Siddhartha then in the early 70s or late 60s or whenever you first read it. Because there was a lot of stuff going on in, at that time, wasn't there? You know, with the Beatles and Maharishi and... You know, Beach Boys. Or was this before? Was it before? But what that, that you... what that book yeah. meant in that particular moment in time? No, there was definitely. It wasn't just the Beatles, but the Beatles were a big influence. They they sort of legitimised it. Although this is a digression, but of course, what happened with the Beatles and Maharishi was that the girls came back and said, "This pervy guy tried to touch me up." Oh my god! Do you know that story? <laughs> no, yeah. go on. Go on. So in a sense, it kind of, it buggered the whole thing about transcendental meditation, which which uh, the Maharishi had founded, and which is now a really useful tool for the modern world for people to, you know, alleviate stress. And, and there are centers all over the world. And it's a, 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 a therapy that so many people use. And it's still rooted in in everything that he taught. But as a personality, I would say that he was very mischievous. And even getting the Beatles to come to his ashram was an act of PR. So mm -hmm. um, we were all sort of sceptical. And for me, the thing about the, the my reading was that I started to read um, what I thought was esoteric stuff about music and i found this 
musician teacher who's actually started the founder of the modern Sufi movement, who was called Hazrat, Hazrat Inayat Khan. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That right? A Persian guy who, who lived in India. He was a famous musician. He played the Vina, which is a simpler version of the sitar with less strings. And he would perform in front of hundreds of thousands of people who couldn't hear him, but they just wanted to be in his presence. And I read um, Idri Shah, who was a Sufi who who wrote adventures. I read um, uh, Herman Hesse. Mm -hmm. I read Jonathan Livingston Seagull, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And in 1967, uh, The Who played at Monterey, and after I had a really bad acid trip on the way back, I was with my friend um, Michael McKinney, an artist, and Dudley Edwards, who ha ha he was the guy, Dudley was the guy who painted John Len Lennon's Rolls Royce in Psychedelic mm -hmm. Colours. Right. <clears throat> anyway, so there was a kind of a, a little hippie group. And was David Vaughan part of that group? Do you know, you know I don't know, but the okay. name was a bell. Okay. Um, he um, and he mentioned the uh, teacher, Meher Baba, and um, I started to read about his stuff and met a few people in America that followed him and found really, in a sense, what I wanted. So I wouldn't say that my seeking, as it were, stopped, but certainly I stopped reading um, what I thought was spiritual literature that would... In fact, so so what I'm saying is that... that, that um, uh, Siddhartha was probably one of the last novels of that kind that I read. I think then I just turned to crime. Sorry, I just want to say one point on that is, is that why, how, because um, you wrote The Ferryman for a 1976 amateur production. That's right. So, yeah, so, so what's the thread there? You know, it... I ran a centre for people who followed my Hababa and one of the, the, oceanic. In the opening yeah. ceremony, which was a 10-day period of stuff, plays, poetry, music. Ronnie Lane from The Faces came and we played together. We did some shows. There were some films made. But one fellow wrote a pretty bad, but he, nonetheless, he wrote a play based on, on Siddhartha. And um, Ronnie Lane's wife was in it. And... Uh, and we, I wrote this song for the for the for the closing of it called the Ferryman, and I recorded that with my father-in-law, my then father-in-law Edwin Astley. Edwin who, Astley, who Great. wrote the orchestration, which Rachel has eased into her version. She's accepted that, and also a couple of other songs were knocking around at the time. Praying the game was another one that I did with with Ted Astley. Yeah. With Ted, yeah. There's a, there's a, you know, there's a connection bet between him and. Well, and this Pete and I have discussed this. What's amazing, yes, because of course Ted did the music for my dad's show, Randall and Hopkirk, and apparently Pete, you have the tapes of all that music. I do said. indeed, yeah. <laughs> uh, Pete, which I, I know that that you mentioned it just a, a while ago, but I think there's a, the story is fantastic, and there is a kind of, and I and I am paralleling some of your life with what happens to Siddhartha and how Rachel obviously recognized that to a certain extent, but you, your, tr your trip on that plane, that story, if you don't mind med telling us more about that, because that was. Yeah, sure. No, no, the, the, um, <clears throat> um, the grateful deads, um, drug manager, I suppose you'd call him his clinic, the clinician, Ambiance that, coordinator. Al Pink Al Floyd used to have one. It was called Ambiance <laughs> um, um, coordinator. <laughs> yeah, had just developed a, a very, very powerful form of LSD called STP, he called it. It was um, about 20 times more powerful than Sandoz, which was what was going around London, which was pretty powerful, clinical stuff. His was sort of made in a, a San Francisco lab. And he gave a tab to me and he gave a tab to... Keith Moon and me and my then girlfriend got on the airplane opposite Keith and John. Roger was to one side. Keith said, I think I'm going to enjoy this trip and took this tab. And 
my girlfriend and I were quite sort of religious about LSD. You can't possibly have a trip on your own, you know. So we broke the tab in half and had half each. And it was just spectacularly awful. It was just, you know, after about three or four hours, you know, you came down off this this dark trip into something that was more like LSD as I knew it. But um, I left my body and um, and heard these voices telling me to get back into my body. I remember looking back at myself and my girlfriend sitting next to me um, and maybe staying out of my body for about five minutes until I was bullied back into my body by what was must have been like an astral voice. So it really changed my perception of what, where my consciousness was. I suddenly felt that my consciousness existed outside my body and that my brain um, was the thing that, that connected my consciousness to my body. Well, in actual fact, when I was on this trip, it felt to me like my consciousness existed outside my body. I'm not trying to make any great statements here. I've had a few few people like shoot me down um well you were on lsd so what the fuck do you know you know i mean it's it's um but what was interesting was when i left my body the trip ended the trip stopped so i test ah. back into my body and then i would still be on the trip and i'll come out and then i'll be kind of squeaky clean so anyway that that sort of really where the whole thing for me about suspending disbelief in a sense you know i think it's very easy indeed to be a non-believer to be an atheist i think it's really really easy you just take the piss out of everybody that believes in anything and just say well i'm ready to turn to dust mm. and what's harder is actually trying to rationalize something which you instinctively feel you know, whether it's in the case of Rachel, I've, you know, I've seen Rachel have conversations with horses. You know, she's psychic. And and I have sort of certain psychic abilities. Several people that I've put curses on have had the most terrible things happen to them to the point where I've actually had to stop doing it. And also you know, when Pete... <laughs> when Pete certainly bear that in mind. Yeah, when Pete's <laughs> beloved guitar tech died, Alan Rogan. Oh, uh, yeah. He yeah. had a moment with a baby deer that had got caught in a fence. Do you remember? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What's that? Good, what story? Well, that was sort of, yeah. that was, you said it was like Alan. It was sort of a... Oh, yeah. I was, I, just, I, was, driving, I was driving into up, up, up our house. We have a lot of deer around our house. And there was a dead deer, a baby deer, a dead deer, caught up in some barbed wire. And I pulled over my car and I went over to it and I started to help it, but it was dead. So I was just going to pull it out and pull out the, pull the, the deer out and then take it to be buried or whatever, turned into meat. And, um, and just as I got it down, it came to life and ran away. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. And, um, and I came into Rachel and I said, I've just had just had a conversation with Alan Rogan. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> I died the night before. But the deer didn't say hi, Pete. It's Alan. Um, well, hey, that's what Alan yeah. always used to say, wasn't it? Well, hey. Yeah. <laughs> did, uh, did so for you, Rachel? Is was making this record? Are you trying to put something? It's quite. It's, it's hard, or is it easy to find spirituality in in the music? Is that what you were trying to achieve? I think Euphoric. the main thing was I wanted I wanted a story that I found personally inspiring that, like you say, would I would find it easy to write the music. And it felt like a really solid story. And also nothing sort of groundbreaking. It wasn't a new story. You know, it is the story of everything. It's the story of Tommy. It's the story of Quadrophenia. It's yeah. the story of a, a million films. Um since time began about human beings desire to whether or not it is to become enlightened or God realized, but just to know themselves and to know why they're here and what we're doing here. And, you know, especially I think more in the modern world today, people talk about mindfulness, just wanting to have peace and a break from the constant thinking that we 
you know, seem to have got into. Um, and I found it very easy to compose the music. Um, I would literally just read the book. I would read a chapter. I would, and then I would sit at the piano and write. <clears throat> yeah. so I wouldn't say it was in any way. I don't know. I mean, my own personal beliefs. There was. There's nothing in it that makes me that goes against what I personally. One believe. thing that's very interesting: a difference between Rachel and I is that we used to have conversations before she read Siddhartha about the fact that I've. Once you know, since '67, I've had, in a sense, not a tr not a bossy guru, but I've had a teacher, you know, whose work mm -hmm. writings I can lean on. I can I can pray and see whether there's a presence, whether there's I can look for sort of angelic presences in my life, you know, whether it's a blowfly that comes and lands on the end of my nose, or you know, whether it's a Land Rover driver waving at me as we go past in our old Land Rovers, whatever it happens to be those signals um but rachel um was pretty vocal about the fact that she didn't really believe in of uh, the idea of handing over your journey to a teacher i don't know if it was that i was jealous i think it was more to do with i was jealous so yeah, perhaps... you were pretty clear about it well, I think as in the story of Siddhartha, you, it's, it's not something you can be taught. Um, but I like that's what, exactly what that's exactly what happens to him, isn't it? He he won't follow the Buddha. He, you know, he, uh, this is this is this, this yeah. is so obviously. Um, is it just me or is it that I I can see so many parallels with Pete's story in this as well? You know that the 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 chance to to meet the Buddha and then and then wanting to to follow the path but then ending up in a place like a vegas type place and sort of spending all his money and going crazy uh, but and then eventually coming back to you know finding the beautiful woman and coming back to the work as it were is that is that did you see that parallel as well rachel no i don't think i did i can't imagine who would it be that you were like gonna have a meeting with john lennon and you went no i don't think so and then no i think i think the thing is is you know there's a 28 year age gap between us and you know by the time rachel and i met those kind of um searches for me both sexual drugs alcohol all of that stuff was finished for me you know i'd done aa i'd done na and I just wanted to settle did. down, have did, a nice, well, no, no, quiet I didn't life. want to settle down and have a nice, quiet life. Because God I, on a Pill is I, one of the I, books, isn't it? May I have to find somebody, you know, my mm -hmm. mum was breaking up. I knew it wasn't going to last. In fact, it was over. And I'd had a couple of girlfriends in America who were very, very nice, very wonderful women. But, you know, they, they all wanted to either for me to go and live in New York or for them to come and live in London and it felt too dangerous a commitment so I decided I met Rachel at a, a rehearsal hall and just really something flashed and I left a letter for her hmm. uh, there and the girl that ran the rehearsal hall had been flirting with me and threw the, rub the letter in the rubbish <laughs> anyway a little later I tracked her down because I'd heard she was an orchestrator and I was doing a concert of Lifehouse at Sadler's Wells. This was in 2000, 1980. Oh, yeah, yeah. I went. We went. And Rachel did some of the uh, orchestrations and that's how we met. And it took a long time for us to settle down together. But I felt that I, if I wasn't going to dabble, you know, I thought if I've got a girlfriend, I don't care you know, whether it feels like love or whether it just feels like sex or whatever it feels like, I'm committed to that. And if this doesn't work, no more. I didn't leave myself any option. Just a spaniel. Wow. <laughs> just a spaniel. And he, made, and he made a really good choice because it was literally a year after we started seeing each other that I ended up in rehab. So <laughs> that's uh, when uh, I said <laughs> once that when I was drunk, I was the closest thing to the reincarnation of Keith Moon he'd ever seen. <laughs> oh. so, Wait, Rachel, when did you just realize how early in this project did you realize that you wanted to use uh well i think it ends up as three of pete's songs in it and one of them is a kind of centerpiece as well i mean if you want me to be like super honest and not come up with something like interesting and slightly pretentious um 
She'd run out of music. I sort of ran out of music. I'd like I'd written and I had these like gaps and and so I was thinking, oh fucking hell. Like yeah, I I find it quite easy to write music. Lyrics are like a ball ache for me. I sit there with my pen and my pencil and it's just like pulling teeth. And I had a couple of spaces and one afternoon it literally popped into my head, oh, what about that track that is on Pete's Scoop album that he wrote for his friends? version of Siddhartha at Oceanic so I found that listened to it I thought this is perfect and I split it in two so I actually got two songs out of one with that one um, and then I was missing the song for um, when Siddhartha meets the ferryman again and says I've had a shit time you know I've done this and this and this and I'm done and I thought the seeker I think it was divine inspiration also there's I've, uh... praying the game and also bargain to yeah, use. yeah. Uh, which bar- I wanted to ask about actually, so uh, about what was the what praying the game was originally, because there was that great period of very kind of almost sondheimy writing you were doing in the seventies. Right. Yeah. It? Um. This this the praying the game was part of the. I wanted to do a project with my father-in-law Edwin Astley, mm-hmm. and I wrote four or five songs: Brooklyn Kids, Very Man, Praying the Game, and a few others. A couple of his Street in the City is that part of that Street in the City, great, yeah. great track, great track. Voted, yeah, and which Glenn takes credit for. I'm not quite sure why, because it was something that I think he I, I'd done a guitar part, and 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 Glenn had said this was for the for Glenn the John. yeah. Um, anyway, um, and. So there were a bunch of those songs, and they ended up on my Scoop series, which is where I would put stuff that was not in my solo career and not in Who career. So sometimes demos, sometimes just noodling, just stuff that represents. For me, I you know, at the moment, I'm thinking about doing a really massive project because I've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces of music that are unreleased. And some of them are unfinished, poetry, bits of prose, you know, journal entries and stuff to do a big book, album, installation almost, just called, you know, 1964 to 2024, 60 years of creative playfulness, you know, with bits and stuff like like song lyrics that are unfinished, partly so that you can see the process. You know, you see a lot of stuff on, on YouTube and Instagram, people nagging you in the way that you have to be creative. You know, somebody needs to occasionally slap Rick Rubin because one minute he's telling us that we need to do do whatever we like. And then on the other hand, he's telling us, you know, that we mustn't do this and we mustn't do that. You know, so I think in a sense, the book of rules for me is just that, you know, I've dabbled with all of those methods. You know, I've carried complete big recording studios on the road with me sometimes and then sometimes I've used little cassette machines I've recorded in all kinds of different ways and if I fancied going into a studio with a huge orchestra I've done that too but what's most interesting is the paper you know the paper the photograph the writing you know some of it's some of it's um, type stuff but I've got all of my lyrics the original lyrics, I've got the scribble for my generation. You know, I've got the scribble for uh, Anywhere, Anyhow, Anywhere, the very first couple of songs that The Who did. Um, so I think in a sense, that stuff, for me, in a way, if somebody came along and said, I want to use that song, that song, that song, and that song in my next, for my next album, I'd be over the moon. So in a sense, when Rachel wanted to use... Uh, uh, the ferryman and praying the game, I was absolutely delighted. I was less certain about how particularly who fans would like it when she took Bargain and the Seeker. I mean, because, like thump, not at all. Yeah, but because, lyrically, they are so perfect for this. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean appears like a love song, but right. it's about God, isn't it? And then and then the Seeker, I mean... And the was, Seeker, I will say the fact that, sorry, Gary, but the, just the tiniest little lyric tweet in the whole thing. That it took just to have absolute to slot it absolutely into. You that got spot. rid of Bobby Dylan. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was I was leaving that open. I was leaving that for the you know people to discover for themselves, gal. But you know. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> so I knew. Um, I I mean, obviously, I love the Who music, but I'm a really big fan of Pete's solo work, and um, so I'd listened to a lot. As are of we all? Stuff, 
um, on his Scoop albums. And I particularly had always loved Praying the Game um, as a song. And as an arranger, I, I absolutely loved the arrangement that Ted Astley had done. Yeah. So that was a good shoe in. I mean, but also, but the sequel and bargain, really, I just had got lazy at the end and I'd written like maybe 21 or 22 songs and I just went sort of scouting. I think also because I, because once fe the ferryman was in, you know, I knew I was in the piece. It felt to me then that, you know, that this was a project that Rachel and I would develop together. Rachel has done you know, 99% of the work, but, you know, my music is in there, but also my presence, you know, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've contributed music, but also a huge amount of, of um, encouragement and guidance in the way that, because, you know, with Tommy and Quadrophenia and various other things that I tried to develop over the years, you know, I've had, I've had experience in, in, creating concept-based story, narrative-based musical project. Yeah. And The Seeker's a massive exercise in this, you know, and I think what's ex extraordinary for me is how brilliant. I, Rachel was just checking the lyrics for the for the, the scripts that the, the singers are going to use for the concert, and it was playing in the background. I was cooking dinner. And I was just thinking, God, this is so brilliant. It's such a brilliant, beautiful, flowing storytelling with amazing kind of reliefs here, you know, and there's no sense of it becoming tiresome or boring in any sense. You know, it's a really wonderful think, piece of work. I think what's, I'm really proud to be a part of it. Well, I think what's really works for me and is is it feels very collaborative i know you've done most of the work rachel quite obviously a great 90 percent as people saying it feels like partly pete's story as well it feels like you know this is a guy a writer who's been seeking for a long time and has and has looked at this idea of seeking a, a different philosophy a different way of living and this is what siddhartha's journey is as well you're embracing each other's creativity mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and completing something that I think seems like it's been, there's been going on for 50 years. Mm. I mean, I think that, like I said earlier, the story of Siddhartha is the story of the human condition. Um, you know, nobody gets out of childhood alive, however fabulous your parents were, you know, we're all a little bit fucked up. We all go through puberty. We're all, you know, we all have hormones as we go through our teens. We all wonder who we are, we struggle with identity, you know, and everybody, I think, is seeking something. And Pete, I definitely knowing a bit about his story when he was younger, was was definitely a seeker. And I don't know whether you've had our podcast, but he talks quite clearly about the fact mm -hmm. that, you know, he was and he found a, a the spiritual master to follow and etc. And I was a mess as a teenager. I mean, I was all over the place. I had OCD. I had, um, you picked a really good one, darling. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I had a bookshelf full of self-help books, probably about a hundred self-help books, none of which I'd read, not a single one. <laughs> um, you know, apart from this one, which I later saw, I think in Pete's library, which was called, what am I doing here? And it had on the cover, it had in bold print one different word. So it was like, what am I doing here? 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 And I really mm -hmm. liked that. So I read the cover of that book a few times, but nothing else. <laughs> but, you know, it was a mess. I was full of anxiety. But I was, silly. Yeah. I was, you know, found drugs and alcohol in my early 20s, which worked for a couple of years, but then not. Um, and... You know, someone just needs to write a handbook for life because essentially what Siddhartha tells you is that there's nothing you can follow, no course that you can do that is going to give you what you want because you already have all the knowledge. Um, so everything that you need, you already possess, which, of course, is extraordinarily annoying. Um, but the older I get, the more I believe that there are actually not really answers to the questions that we have outside of us. But also the other thing is, is you have to go on that journey before you can actually assimilate any of that information really anyway, can't you? Because I would say, and I'm sure Gary would agree with me that the same thing is that it's been very obvious that, you know, that, that Pete's writing and his journey as an artist has been as a seeker. And those of us as fans have very much ascribed to that. 
there's someone else doing the looking for us in a way. <laughs> mm. Well, I think it's you like I mean? you're a form of follower in a way. Yeah. You know, Krishnamurti yeah. sort of um, sits on a stage in front of 2,000 people and says, right, the first thing I need to tell you is that I am not your master. Mm -mm -mm. Um, and they all go, yes, you are not our master. <laughs> and there's like something about followers which is a bit scary i mean especially when it goes fucking sideways well what's like interesting Hitler about what, oh you just maybe it says that life of brian like sorry pete go on, go on. No, 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 that's absolutely right the life of brian thing is really good but i think yeah what, you're all different i'm not <laughs> yeah the, the thing about who fans is not that they follow me they tell me what to do they tell me what to do they tell you know and they've always been telling me what to do and they still tell me what to do and they tell me what i should right. do you know what I should do. I think I think any any who fan I could probably look at would be a, a, a really pretty good spiritual guide. You know, they would have me, you know, on the road like ACDC 365 days a year, all in their hometown. So I think, you know, the 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 idea that the music career that I've led has has, has given me any lessons, it's all been tragic, you know, from mm -hmm. from of Kit Lambert around the time of, of Quadrophenia, the Who's manager Kit Lambert, to then to Keith Moon, to you know, but also before that to you know, and Led Zeppelin to to their drummer, you know, to to Bonzo, you know, who was sat in when we recorded. He didn't play; he just sat in as a visitor when we recorded the backing track for for I won't get fooled again. You know, he, yeah, he was up in up Stargroves. He was up in the balcony, and. Um, you know, so many people along the way, John Entwistle more recently, you know, since then losing David Bowie, you know, losing Lou Reed. The list goes on and on and on, you know, and and what's so extraordinary is that the, is that the business itself seems to have no answers, no mechanism for dealing with that, despite the fact that it's full of, full of Buddhists, you know, from Herbie Hancock to downwards, you know, they're all Buddhists. And... Um, and suggest that they meditate. I think meditation is probably useful if you're if you're in a stressful situation on the road. But one of the things that that um, I've experienced basically through through being you know in the front end of the music business is this sense that it's grace. You know, um, uh, Noel Gallagher talks about you know being in a big band like Oasis as being the best possible thing that could ever have happened to him. You know, he feels that he's really, really lucky and that, you know, lucky to be able to play in front of big audiences. But it's the rest of the stuff that's really difficult. It's the time that you spend on your own. It's the time that you spend trying to, what's the word, sublimate your life, not sublimate, modify your life so it fits in with that, black swan thing that happens to you and you know, we watch you know the struggles that somebody like Adele is going through as a performer trying to kind of you know she's so huge and it's happened so suddenly and so quickly and yet it's still very very difficult to manage for a human being so in a sense the story of Sid Arthur is the story of somebody and it's all from from um the point of view of his best friend who sees him as a perfect man he's got everything you know he's got good looks he's he's clever he's kind the story starts off i want to tell you about my friend Siddharth. Mm -hmm. he is this he is that he is this he is that and it's all from the point of view of govinda the story is told narrated by govinda and that's the role that uh, christopher Blummer um narrates he's the fanboy really isn't he yeah and so that's right he's a fan boswell Boswell. Yeah. Yeah, Boswell. <laughs> but I think in a sense, the 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 every everybody, it's not just about rock stars, pop stars, singers, musicians, artists, or whatever. It's about everybody. This is why I think so many people who are successful in the arts and music tell people everybody is creative. I think everybody might well be creative. It's just that they don't necessarily feel creative. And a lot of them, I think, feel lucky that they don't go through the kind of trials and tribulations that they see big stars go through. So in a sense, what we, what, where, where there's a big parallel for me in Siddhartha is in the fact that, you know, I end up 
in my old age, really not arriving anywhere. <laughs> well, you're still yeah. writing, and that is still a sense of seeking, isn't it? That's I think so. Yeah, yeah, and a sense of trying to kind, in a sense, expiate something. You know, I think one of the things about being the age that I am at the moment, I'll be 80 next birthday, is that sense of running out of time to do creative stuff. Because as Rick Rubin so rightly says, and many other pundits about creativity, it has to be fun. You know, it has to it has to be enjoyable. It has to be something that you love to do. And it also it has to be something that you like what you do. So in a sense, the... The feeling for me is that, you know, that as long as, but it doesn't necessarily mean that anybody else will like it. So I think that the driving blind thing that you do when you're young, the interesting thing about Siddhartha is that he starts driving blind, doesn't he? He doesn't, he doesn't know what, what he's going to do next. You know, he goes to the Samanas, he goes to the this one, that one, you know, he tries the high life. And in that sense, you know, I did experiment. I did experiment with hard drugs, even mm. though I wasn't interested in them. I felt I had to experiment mm. in them to know what I was talking about in order to get a sense that I knew I didn't need them in a way, you know. So I definitely, I definitely ended up like sweaty and bloated like Siddhartha did after his time in the city. Sweaty and bloated. Sweaty and bloated, yeah, after years and years of, uh binging on alcohol and drugs and fine women and yeah how'd you get elton on the record because that's i mean he's a friend of pete's he's you know they've known each other pete was at elton's show at the troubadour when elton was oh like you were at that show wow. 17 and wow. you were 19 or he doesn't know that I was there he was 19 and oh. one or so you know they've known each other for a really long time well and... actually elton elton's band with Elton, supported The Who at a very, his, one of his early shows at the Roundhouse. And then uh, the next day I saw him at the Speakeasy and I stopped him and I'd heard the new album, um, the second album that they did, the one with Paul Buckmaster orchestrations on. Oh, yeah. And just stopped him and said... Mav and Cross the Water. Yeah, you're going to be... No, 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 no. It's just called Elton John. Elton John. Elton John. Elton John, yeah, sorry. You're going to be fucking huge. You know, you're a genius. You're incredible. And I That didn't... album he did with the radio show, the live radio show, This I think it's called something like the 11th of November 1971. I mean, it's just the three of them. And he's 23 years old. His talent is unbelievable. And, of course, you know, he was working then with his co-writer, with, with, with Bernie, and and I didn't know that then. I thought he was doing it all. But um, you know, Bernie's really brilliant as well. So you know, and and they're back together again. And he's writing lyrics for him now, again. So you know that I I think um, we sort of. I think I discouraged Rachel. I said not not because I thought Elton would say no, but I just thought. Dare I say this? You know, you don't need him. You don't need any more stars. You don't, you know, because we had Nakane, and Nakane was such a great voice. But um, Rachel persisted, and she she really adores Elton. Who it's adores Dice, him. isn't it? The track Dice is that what he, one he's on? Yeah, he, well, he, he's in theory that he's the he's adores, adores, Swam, Karen, yeah. Um, yeah, and so voice is amazing on it, and. We went to we he he was keen to do it. We went over to Milan where he was doing some recording for a theatre show he was working on, and he knocked it off in a couple of hours. You know he's really fast working mm. and and really nailed it. I mean the interesting thing about Elton is that he's not just a big star, not just a great talent, but he's also a really committed and focused worker. Rachel but, uh, Pete's voice on Ferryman on this album is yeah. amazing. Mm. I've never heard you sing quite like that, Pete. It's really, really full on. Well, you'll be able to hear it live next week. <laughs> Absolutely. On oh, Wednesday. Yes. At, at, oh, at, oh, at, yeah. Another one, Sunidi Chowan. Beautiful, beautiful voice. She's a big star. A yeah, Hollywood, Bollywood star. You know, yeah. She plays to huge arenas with crazy fans and fireworks and done a couple of stadiums too. Mm. Yeah. Some of the casting around, haven't you, for the live show? 
Yeah, we've um, Emily Sande was unable to do it um, due to other commitments. So uh, we have this fabulous uh, singer. She's British, but she's actually in New York at the moment coming over, Yola. Um, and then Tyrone Huntley, who's a big theatre performer, mm, 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 mm. Um, is also unable to do it. So Leighton Williams is singing his role. Um who we know from Strictly, right? He was on. Yeah. Brilliant. And um, who we actually just spent a couple of days in France with, with him and his partner. He's a, a riot. I adore him. He's such That's good fun. Good, good fun. And uh, and Harvey's put it all together. Harvey Goldsmith, who was on this show. Put it all together. I love Harvey. In fact. Love Harvey. Yeah, you should do a podcast with me and Harvey and how I always... Well, that's why that's what he said this was going to be because when I was doing the yeah. Albert Hall, <laughs> yeah. well, that's... All, so were you going to speak to me and Rachel? And, yeah, and so Harvey I thought Harvey does, was like, coming. Harvey does Live Aid and Live Aid and all the really big things like Dave Gilmore and then he gets this like scrappy little Essex bird on the phone. Harvey, I'm going to do a show. <laughs> and I say, you're not going to make any money. It's going to be really stressful. It's going to be hard to sell tickets. And he always does me a real solid, Harvey. He's like, yeah, of course I will. He was on this show. He told some of the greatest stories. We, 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 had, we had to split it into two. It was so good. Yeah. We had to split it into two. But, but, but my um, one Harvey, little Harvey story I've got to tell is that Har I was a judge <laughs> with Harvey on an Eastern European X Factor show for young classical prodigy musicians. Wow. Yeah. Which was amazing. I hope you've got a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly not. Are you are you thinking I mean, this is a one off on Wednesday, but is it possibly going to be more than a one off? Is that the plan? Um, I mean, originally I did write it as a as a theatre piece, but like we said, it takes years and years and years and I lost patience. Um, but there is a possibility that it will end up on a stage. I mean, I'd like to see it on a stage. Um, America. I mean, I think it's a story that would work anywhere. It is essentially just about sort of, you know, the human condition and love. And One thing that's going on at the moment in, in um, music theatre, <clears throat> you know, Broadway and and maybe London as well, but, you know, in certain regional theatres as well, you know, Hope Mill up in Manchester has got a new piece. I can't remember the name of it, but it's the, they brought it back several times. I think it's called Ziggy or something. Ziggy, I think it's called Ziggy. And, um, you know, that might end up in in, in the West End. But <clears throat> there's incredible competition. And also, because of jukebox musicals, the mm. patience of audiences has waned. They're not necessarily committed to... We went to see um, uh, Rufus Wainwright's version of... Uh, what was it called? The... Yeah, I went to see that too, yeah. What was it yeah. And the last opening night, opening night, yeah. And Sheridan Smith was fucking brilliant and absolutely mm. brilliant. But I absolutely loved it. And apparently, a couple of nights before, a whole chunk of the, the stall's audience, when it came to the half time, got up and walked out because what they felt was that they were going to a Sheridan Sheridan Smith kind of song fest. You know, and that wasn't what it was. Um, she was brilliant in it, and and you, you know, but anyway. So when Tommy went on Broadway recently uh, in in March, you know, we 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 got fantastic reviews. We got incredible attendances. We did the Tony Awards. Hell's Kitchen was on. Uh, Stereophonic was on bunch of other music shows were on the Tonys didn't get didn't give us anything you know I, I think in a sense we were cancelled for some reason or other but anyway um the the business immediate because New York is five boroughs immediately started to sink the producers panicked pulled the show I'd been working on the show for a year you know and suddenly this show which was just spectacular is gone you know, music music theatre is really tricky. What Rachel was talking about um, with um, Oscar Eustace at Public Theatre was that they were then working on or, or had just completed Hamilton, which they knew was going to be huge. But how many workshops did they do? I mean, 13 workshops for wow. Hamilton. Wow. Maybe hopefully, more, maybe hopefully not nine months between every one of them. You know? well, hopefully not. But but one of the interesting things is is that it is if it 
if it takes and it lasts, as you know from stuff like um, Lion King, you know, it's now up to what, 250 billion or something. And mm -hmm. because I mean, this is so visually, I mean, it could happen visually be, be, to be visually beautiful. Because the, I mean, I was we showed this on the intro that we did that you sent me, Rachel. Thank mm. you. It's uh, I that. Has that got a in it? graphic novel with two vinyls. Yeah, yeah mm. I got it from the Universal. And this and the graphic stuff into the graphic. Yeah, it's novel, beautiful. It's beautiful. The style is wonderful. How how did you find this person? So it's actually she's a she's a young artist from Cornwall in Falmouth called Amelia, and I worked with her originally on. I was doing a website for another project, um, and she helped with the website design. And then when David Joseph and I from Universal were talking about doing a graphic novel to accompany the album, you know, I had a list of these sort of quite well-established um, graphic novel artists and I looked at all their styles, but I kept coming back to Amelia and um, I'd had such a great time working with her and she's so brilliant. I mean, and her work is really so unique. She's there's sort of like a modern day um is it what's his name? Quentin Blake. Is that yeah. the guy that yeah. uh, uh, illustrates well dull? Yeah, yeah. Oh, but yeah, yeah, of course. He, yeah, yeah. He really thinks outside the box with regards to how beauty and things are actually portrayed in in a in a very real visual way. Um, so I just decided that we would we would do it together, and that's how it came about. But she's extraordinary. Um extraordinary artist. I think the artwork is just beautiful. It's an animation of the project could be a possibility when you look at yeah, that. No, absolutely i mean i do think though you know talking about theater and pizzas you know even tommy sort of you know has struggled so i mean my plan is that after this i might just open up like a dog's home for old dogs and just like look after old dogs until they die isn't that what you already have, Rachel? Isn't that? <laughs> I could argue that I've been doing that for. A... <laughs> you know, I, I have to mention, I have to mention this because she won't she won't forgive me if I don't say it. But you went to see my ex wife Sadie's film about Twiggy. Mm -hmm. oh, I, was... I couldn't go. I was away. It, oh, it's absolutely. really good. You're in it, aren't you, Pete? Isn't yeah. Loved it. No, I mean, I I made I did do a. a... That was Quant. Yeah. Oh, I that did... was Quant. Sorry, sorry. Yes, yes. And in, in, uh, there's a quick picture of me in in mod mode in there mm. but no it's it's really really good it's really moving mm. and sadie's done the most incredible job of dealing with the ending of it it mm. ends with her daughter her one daughter twiggy's daughter twiggy's daughter just saying something about her mum, and it just is heartbreaking it's oh. absolutely heart incredibly moving and that's the mm. end of the there's another, you know, there's credits roll after that, but it's such a brilliant stroke. Because not cause... quite a spoiler. They're not quite a spoiler. Almost a spoiler. Not quite a spoiler. Well, I don't think it's a spoiler at all. No. Because no, okay. When you actually get to see it, you may expect it to come, but you won't know what she says. Just get... <laughs> there's a, we had yeah. Twiggy. We had Twiggy on. Uh, yeah. And there's that awful Woody Allen moment when Woody. Oh, yeah. But she's uh, so brilliant in that, and I mean, I think that brilliant. You know. Yeah. Sadie's What's your favourite philosopher? Absolutely yeah. um, brilliant. In fact, we're looking to work um, with Sadie to do, direct a documentary about the making of Quadrophenia as a as a mod ballet with Sadler's Wells and dipping oh. into the history. We didn't even mention your work on Quad and... and yeah, ballet. amazing work on Quadrophenia. But just, yeah, so I think we should just hang on to the seeker for now to say yeah. people... Get tickets. Well, also, yep. Yeah, yes, go and see this. Because there was one thing I did want to say was if you felt an affinity, Rachel, with it, because you're the way that you, you're. There seems to be a lot in common with your arrangements and Edwin Astley's. I wonder if you've, you've that. There seems oh, to be I a think, I think, Oh God, no! I think like um, Ted Astley's arrangements. He's far superior um, as an arranger than I am. Um, and like I said, I do work with this guy Martin. So in Quad who had who had Martin has some eccentricities. He. He has this technique of sometimes a, a chord change is coming up. He changes the chord before the chord changes, leaving the other chord underneath. So you get this sort of sluicing effect of chord changes. Uh, really do you cool. know what? There's, that's really funny you say that because there's a fantastic arranger that um, David's been working with on the new album. And there's a lot of that. I call it foreshadowing. That's right, yeah. Mm. But yeah. Also, also, And there's a lot of that on the new album. It's a brilliant thing. Yeah, yeah. the new album is just wonderful. 
That's wonderful. You know, it's wonderful to, at, at last, you know, there's, there should be some Paul and Linda, John and Yoko, Pete and Rachel, and David and Polly stuff going on, because Polly, I've always loved her writing, particularly her poetry. She's they, so clever. They don't like us. I tell you what, it's not sour grapes. <laughs> but, it's just the fact of life. They do not like the wives. Like I literally wanted to end on this, because the one thing I want to say is, like, is it's no. so nice, because I'm part of, I love being part of this absolutely brilliant husband and wife team working together right it's a fantastic thing well, like people and do this is this is great to be here with another one you know yeah but it's there's still very much it's like look you've got the man now just fuck off and cook some pies and have some babies <laughs> and like go to some red carpet events and what i think you've done here though rachel is you've embraced some of that of his legacy and you've rejuvenated it and you put it into a, you know, a stolen like a... some of his songs. Nick really. his song. I mean, I like oh. how you put it with the use of the word legacy, but really I stole some, stole some songs and they fit very nicely. Well, so listen, I hope I'm looking forward to going. I'm going to go. Uh, I can't. I'm I'm playing the garden that night, sadly. But... Oh, guy. You're living, with Trump. You're living your best life. Yes. <laughs> no, he is. Um, and hopefully, We'll have a decent result from America at the same time as oh. watching your. Uh, uh, oh fuck! Yeah, we're playing election night. So when is election night? The fifth, a Guy Fawkes night. Okay, and also there's a cheese strike on the sixth, so I've chosen a really good night for the concert. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, Gus, Gus, and I can't come. Really Gus, I know it's going to be amazing. It's a fantastic piece. It's really brilliant. Congratulations, yeah. to, congratulations to you, Rachel. Really lovely to see you both.